you very much. It's my uh, privilege and honor to be here, and I really appreciate the invitation um, for me to come to Taiwan to uh, share our experiences uh, with this landslide in particular. Um, this is a bit of a departure maybe from some of the other talks in that I'm talking about a landslide that already happened rather than one that uh, maybe could happen. Um, but this was a, a very significant event in the United States, um, had the 43 fatalities, and um, it was the, the landslide with the second largest number of fatalities. It's small comparatively, I think, to a lot of other countries in the world, but it was an important event for the United States, and so uh, we spent uh, the past four years investigating the mechanism uh, of mobility. And so I'm going to share the, uh, it's essentially a case study of this, but I think it has some important implications for um, deciphering and understanding uh, the landslides that uh, move very slowly versus those that can move catastrophically. I'd like to acknowledge uh, first here as well, my co-author Mark Reed, he's also at the US Geological Survey and uh, the two of us have performed this study over the past four years. So a brief outline, this will be, as I mentioned, a case study. Um, and we spent a lot of our time actually doing sort of a forensic analysis of this landslide. And so um, some of the implications of that are, I'm going to focus on the importance of careful and very detailed geologic mapping after the landslide occurs. And I'll uh, put that in the context of understanding landslide sequencing. So there was a lot of uh, research that went into this from various groups. And what we found is that the sequence of the landslide, so which components moved first, which moved last, and, and how they moved was very important to understanding the long mobility of the landslide. Um, and then finally, um, I'm, this is uh, some very new research uh, that we've been doing, um, but we essentially have uh, isolated what we think to be the predominant triggering mechanism for the mobility. And so I'll share some, uh, some thoughts on that towards the end. So this is a, a picture of the Oso landslide. So this happened March uh, 22nd, uh, four years ago. And you can see here um, a couple of features. This is the, uh, the river uh, running through here. This was uh, displaced. It, was, it used to be here, and the landslide pushed that away. And just for perspective, um, from here down to here, this is about 180 meters. And then uh, this is about uh, one and a half kilometers per scale. So this landslide um, pushed the river. It, it buried a section of this road, the state road that links to uh, small towns, but it's an important transportation route. And most importantly, there was a whole neighborhood here, uh, about 50 homes. And um, so the resultant uh, effect of that was 43 fatalities and 35 of those homes destroyed. This area here is the, the Oso landslide in red. And uh, immediately following this landslide, um, this sort of mapping hadn't actually been done, this line based mapping of pre-existing landslides. So this was, um, I, I think, a discovery for a lot of people that we could have such a large landslide cross the entire river valley. That was uh, news to a lot of people. Of course, when we look at LIDAR maps, um, it's very obvious that there's some other landslides that have the ability to, to cross the entire river valley. And so uh, currently now the state of Washington, so uh, uh, the, the government in the state of Washington is, is conducting this sort of mapping for the whole state to identify uh, potential landslide sources. Um, but here we can see the, the implications of that is that sometimes the landslides uh, don't move very far and sometimes they move across the entire valley. And this was the case uh, for that Oso landslide. So this uh, led the, to the question in terms of this landslide and looking at the previous map of why do some of the landslides go so far? And so if I go back here for a second, you can look and you say that this, this is where the community uh, was built. This is where the homes were um, in this area. And so if this landslide had acted like any one of these, then there would have been no problem. Uh, but in this case, uh, there was a big problem because the landslide traveled all the way across the valley. So this is the, the subject of a lot of the research. 
We purposely weren't looking at the initiation mechanism. That's sort of a whole other story uh, of what the uh, precise timing was related to, say, precipitation or progressive strength loss in the, in the clays. This is mainly uh, glacial sediments. But instead, we focused on the mobility. We wanted to know why some of the landslides go shall, uh, short distances and some of them go long distances. Uh, I, I put this slide up here just to recognize that this is a big event for the United States and there's been a lot of other research done on this. There's been a, a lot of competing uh, theories, in fact, of the mobility. Various people have tried different models of that. Um, but what we found through looking at all this and our um, investigation sort of spans um, the time frame where all these other studies were conducted, there's really two unresolved questions that we don't think have, have been fully addressed and this was the purpose of our research. Uh, the main, uh, the first one is, uh, what's the sequence and the timing of the events? And this, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to look at the geologic mapping and try to explain that sequence. And, um, you know, I think the take-home message from that is the importance of this detailed mapping to really understand sequencing. If you don't understand the sequence, then you have a problem understanding the timing. And then, um, obviously, the, the timing is related to the, the mobility. And then the second question is, um, more on the mechanism and what's the likely cause of enhanced mobility for these kind of landslides. So why do some of them go far and, and some of them not? <clears throat> so some background on this, and this is particularly important if you keep in mind the slide that I showed of all the other landslides in that section of the valley. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an area of the slide that was active um, over the past 80 years. And so this was a known, um, sort of a known hazard, I think, in a lot of regards. This is where the homes were built, uh, down over here. And so this landslide had been failing for at least 80 years, probably longer. Um, and um, this even had a name. They called it the Hazel Landslide. And it had most recently activated in 2006. But in that, in that time frame, it crossed the river, but it stopped right here. It stopped before the, the neighborhood. And so I think that led a lot of people to believe that this was the expected behavior, is that they had watched this landslide uh, come down for many, many years, and it had never come on the other side of the valley. So I think this built a, a sense of maybe safety in people's minds that this was um, not something to worry about. But obviously when we, when we dig deeper and we start looking at uh, some of the older events that could happen from this, then we see that there's evidence, at least, of a, what we call a paleo landslide here. And this is a prehistoric landslide. This uh, river valley was uh, glaciated um, in the last um, glacial uh, maxima. So we know that this landslide is likely less than 15,000 years. It hasn't been dated any, any better than that. Um, but we know that there's, there's evidence for large scale landsliding here. And I just want to introduce um, this section here because this was actually part of the landslide event uh, that happened in 2014. I call this Whitman, and so um, it'll be somewhat important, I guess, to understand, keep, keep this in mind, you'll be, you keep seeing these again and again, the Hazel, the Paleo, and the Whitman components of this. These are the important sections. This is a glacial terrace bench, it has four units, and it's pretty much a glacial outwash and glacial till, uh, more outwash, and then lacustrine clay. So this is a very typical glacial sequence um, for this part of the United States. And this, um, this stratigraphy allowed us to do some very detailed mapping, and I think this was the key to understanding the sequencing. So our field investigation was really focused on understanding and mapping uh, these different units. Typically, I don't think we have the ability to understand the geology, the post-failure geology of these uh, type of events, because everything um, may be mixed up. It could be a, a colluvium, and you can't identify the different components. But in this case, um, we were able to do that, and so well, what we found to be important was to separate really our observations from our interpretations. This was a very important factor for us, so documenting what we saw on the ground, and then later on trying to interpret that into a story. Uh, here's an example of some of the mapping that we did, and I put this slide here just to, uh, I guess, make the, the point that this detailed geologic mapping is sometimes important. Um, this here is, is a case where uh, the original interpretation um, might be something else. This might look like outwash, uh, but in this case it was actually glacial till. And so we actually dug into about 1,500 of these uh, landslide hummocks to map that geology. This is the resultant uh, geological map from that. And I think um, 
what's very interesting about this is that um, we were able to map these lithologically intact units. So as mobile as this landslide was, it actually kept a lot of its structure, and that structure was important for understanding what was going on. So we have these, these different components. So here's the recessional outwash and the till and the advanced outwash and the lacustrine clay. And this sequence then repeats itself down in here. There's also a very big debris flow front. Off of that, this is actually what did the most damage. This is what killed the most people. It pushed the houses towards the end uh, of the deposit. But this mapping here was very important for understanding, for example, if you start thinking about the sequence that would allow this to be out here versus back here, you have a big opening section here of this clay. And the only way that this clay can be exposed in that location is if this moves first. And so there's, there's a lot of different um, uh, opinions about that sequencing, but I think we have the, the field evidence, at least for explaining the sequence. We also looked a lot at the landsite structures. And what I've shown here is uh, those different components. We have very big, a back-rotated rotational block up here. We have these very detailed slices, that sort of longitudinally uh, or latitudinally across the slope. And then we get into a hummock field, um, multi-sided, uh, faceted blocks that uh, indicate lateral spreading. And then we have isolated hummocks, and then this is sort of a chaotic zone. This is primarily the, uh, the debris flow. And what's important about understanding these, the, these different components, this is you know, detailed mapping, and, and some might uh, ask, what's the value of this sort of thing? But without these sort of observations, we can't understand the structure, whether things are in compression, whether things are in extension. And that's very important for, again, understanding that sequence of what happened first and what happened last. In this particular case, what we see is that this is almost ubiquitous extension, so extensional uh, mechanics. And so this block here, for example, as I mentioned, this happened after this, and that makes sense because those two pieces must have pulled apart from each other. And I'll show, I'm gonna uh, show a little detail section of here between uh, this part and this part from our geological mapping. We also looked very carefully at um, the vegetation, and this is uh, an example. To my mind, I think this is really critical, um, and it's also uh, just very elucidating that we have the ability to, uh, to use trees as mobility markers. So what we've done here is we've taken a LIDAR differencing map. So there was LIDAR data from 2013 that had already been collected. Then there was a post-LIDAR collection after the landslide. And these are tree heights. So these are trees up here, uh, about you know, 30 to 40 meters. And then this side here, these trees are a lot lower, less than 15 meters. Um, and there was some logging up here, so some forestry practices that had cut down the trees. So these trees here are also shorter. Now what we've done here is we mapped the length of the trees, whole sections of trees. So trees where we can see the tips of the tree and also the root ball. So we have the whole length. And when we compare those, we're actually able so these trees here are color-coded according to this section. And so we are able to put this mobility map together based on, on trees. And so you can see some of these, these uh, blue colors here representing the very um, uh, the tallest trees. These must have come from a, a section up here. And so that gives us uh, a relationship, basically, to understand those two components. So when I look at the sequence and sort of bringing all this data all together, uh, this is what you see. As I mentioned, we have these three components. The hazel slide, this is the existing one. The paleo slide, this is the post-glacial, so less than 15,000 years. And then this Whitman, this is the unfailed part. And so when we use the geology map and the structure map and the tree mobility map, then we can start to understand where those three um, components went. And so this is our interpretation of the sequence the, the hazel moving to here, the hazel moving to here, and the Whitman uh, spreading out in the, into this location. So we have multiple sources, multiple deposits, but the structural evidence really says that it all moved together. Um, there was a, a lot of studies that went into understanding the seismic uh, analysis of this landslide. Um, and our evidence sort of shows that uh, these two components, or these three components, moved together. So as I mentioned, we looked at that structural evidence and um, a lot of this, so when we have hummocks, when we have these slices, when we have all this pulling, what's basically going on is that this deposit is an extension. 
And this is important for then understanding the mobility. So a landslide in compression would have acted differently as across the valley versus a landslide acting in extension. So these are the kind of observations that we needed to make this sort of a deduction. And we, we hope that this is the kind of analysis and this is the kind of data that people will then subsequently use for, for modeling. So I mentioned that uh, there's this important contact between uh, the Whitman area and this paleo and hazel component. And this is right in here. And this is this area of repeated stratigraphy. So we have this glacial custron, which is the bottom most unit, exposed in a very large uh, swath right here. And this has a, a contact with the topmost uh, recessional outwash unit. So this is a, a, a contact, an important uh, unconformable contact. This is an example of that. Uh, actually, this is, this is the data from that section. And we mapped the different trees, the different styles of motion uh, from here. So these blue trees uh, show examples of some compressional uh, motion. So trees are either buried or maybe they're snapped in half. This will only happen from a sort of compressional regime. Versus well, here we have trees that are overlying the block and trees with drag marks. These are examples of things that would happen only from extensional regime. So when we look at this and we say, okay, we have some compression, we also have extension, but we also look at this, these Graben features right in here. So this is also extension. So how do you get compressional features in an extension zone? This was very puzzling to us. Um, but it's a very, this is probably one of the most important contexts of this landslide for understanding those two mechanisms. What we think was happening here was the first landslide, this paleo and the hazel portion moved first triggered the back section of the Whitman, and those two then moved together very closely. And so we've used uh, the analogy of an accordion, which is a you know, musical instrument that goes back and forth like this, and so these two components of the landslide may have been moving back and forth with some compression, but overall extension over the whole zone. Here are some of those details showing the, the kind of mapping that we needed to do. So this is collisional, so these are, these are buried trees, these are snapped trees, these are extensional. Here you have the drag marks, and this is a, a, a large Graben feature. There's a, a person in each of those for scale. <clears throat> okay, so this is the, the conclusion, I think, from, from this first phase of the mapping, that when we have this collision and extensional, that, that indicates that these two components are moving together. So in terms of the sequencing, I mentioned that this, all this geological mapping comes together to understand the sequence. Um, this is our interpretation. So that these two components here first moved out, and then um, this one uh, moved back. And so uh, not necessarily so obvious from the initial uh, mapping that one might perform. Uh, we found that we really needed to actually go out and do this detailed mapping to put this sequence together. Okay, I'll turn my attention now. This is, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, there's sort of two questions we're looking at. We're looking at the sequencing, and then we're looking at the cause of the mobility. And so this is this new research that I mentioned. When we were out uh, making our observations, what we found were um, sand boils throughout the deposit field. And so you can see some of these features here. Now sand boils are typically uh, associated with liquefaction that happens from earthquakes. So when you have a loose alluvium or loose colluvium, loose uh, granular soils, and an earthquake shakes these soils, if they're saturated, they actually compress and you get elevated pore pressures. So the water pressure uh, goes up. This can then make um, the effective stress of the soil go to zero, and the soil can turn into basically a liquid. So zero shear strength. So we have this evidence of liquefaction throughout the deposit. These sand boils are examples, they're post-failure, uh, post-depositional features of these pore pressures dissipating after the landslide was in the deposit. They're one of the last things to have formed. So this gives us an indication that something in, uh, in the subsurface had liquefied, had lost uh, absolutely complete shear strength. So the shear strength went to zero, this was a liquid. What is that component? What is that part of the, the landslide that would actually go to zero? Um, and so without these observations, then we're, we're sort of lost to understand. We might start assuming that, uh, how do you get a landslide to propagate across the entire river valley? 
the only thing that could do that would probably be a very, very, very low residual strength. So uh, this lacustrine clay that forms the primary failure surface in a majority of the landslide, that uh, this, the cohesion would have to go down, you'd have to reach post-peak failure, and you'd have to get all the way down to a very low residual strength. That still wouldn't explain how the landslide actually crossed the entire river valley. It's a flat valley. It should have stopped at some point if that had happened. And so we think that's probably what happened in the 2006 reactivation, some of the past reactivations. This is why the landslide did not cross the valley, is because the clay had some residual strength. The clay at the failure surface had some residual strength. Instead, we're looking for a different, different answer. We're looking for a different culprit. We're looking for something that would explain these liquefaction features. So something came up from the subsurface and indicating that something liquefied down at the bottom. So we did a, a, a lot of analysis for this. We sampled all the different soils. The, the primary um, characteristics of these is that they are very, very similar to the alluvium that underlies the entire river valley. And this was the, the key to our understanding of that mobility. So I'll show you this distribution of some, this is uh, some of the, the sand boil sites that we mapped. Um, they're mapped in according uh, to sort of two different classifications. One is the, the number of sand boils, and then they're also based on whether they're located on a, a deposit that was greater than five meters thick or less than five meters thick. And uh, this is an important um, attribute here. I mean, five meters of pore, pore water pressure is a significant number. I mean, this is, if this was uh, the case, then this really had uh, pressure underlying the failure plane enough to sort of float the landslide across the valley. This is one of the largest uh, sand boil features here, about almost half a meter in diameter. So as I mentioned, um, we've sort of pinned the source of these sand boils to be the alluvium. And uh, this is a, a key attribute here. When we look at um, this section, this is the, the area of the river valley um, where we had the sand boils. So this is where we found sand boils, and this is the part of the deposit um, where that's located. When we look at the river valley, so now we're looking at a, a pre uh, this is an aerial photo from 2003, uh, a pre-landslide. Here's a little bit different extent of the, the river, moved a little bit even uh, into here. And what we can see is that when we map what we presume to be the alluvium, the flat river valley, this is all the alluvium. And the alluvium is composed of presumably very loose sands and gravels. So the alluvium is a very well-known uh, material that can liquefy in earthquakes. So why can't it also liquefy as a result uh, of a landslide. And we think that's the key here, is that when you imprint these two on top of each other, um, we think that as the landslide came down, it overrode the alluvium, and the alluvium actually liquefied. The base of the landslide was formed of lacustrine clay. The weight of the landslide impacting the, uh, the alluvium uh, generated liquefaction in that subsurface layer. And I think that's a very important component for modeling long run out landslides, is understanding that it's not only important to, under, to model the landslide material, the source material, but we must consider what's going on underneath uh, where the deposit rides out. In this particular case, we think it uh, explains very nicely why this landslide moved across the entire river valley. Um, we think it has important implications. It's not necessarily a, a, an example um, that is widespread. Uh, some of these landslides um, may not be big enough to cross over here and actually generate those pore pressures that would then liquefy the soil. So it's a special set of characteristics. But obviously there's examples in the river valley that I showed um, uh, that can do that. And here I just show some of, the, uh, some of our evidence for that. So this is the lacustrine clay landslide and it's overriding this alluvium. There's no shear plane, uh, well, there's a shear plane, but there's no special material in between. The landslide's actually uh, probably liquefied this material and it's a very sharp contact here. So conclusion number one, um, and just recapping, we have this, uh, this sequence mapped, the, the Haleo-Pazel contact and this Paleo-Whitman contact that had that compression extension, and this is the, the attributes that would lead to um, the, seeing this pattern in the geology. And then we look at uh, conclusion number two related to the mobility. 
we find that the majority of the deposit didn't lose strength. So this is not a liquefied mass up here. This is an intact stratigraphy with blocks. And so we can't necessarily assign a zero sort of uh, strength mass to this. This retained its strength. What, what became, um, what lost its strength was actually at the base. So why did the landslides go so far? We think it has to do with the large size of that landslide, uh, the rapid loading that it underwent, and the strength loss under, underneath. And so when we start looking at what can explain large runout landslides and how can we move forward with this, I think we have to consider that some of these large landslides in the past may have also occurred due to the same process. And it's not necessarily something that's going to happen in every case, but it might be something to consider. So we have to understand and assess that potential for this type of landslide. How do we know that this sort of landslide uh, then might turn into that sort of landslide? It's a difficult question. Uh, admittedly. And I think um, just in the course of the field trips over the past two days, it's something that's come up. I, I think we share similar problems in that. So understanding how you take a, a maybe a rather small activation and then lead that to, uh, to something larger. So um, uh, with that, I, I'll end. Thank you. <laughs>